Hi, welcome to the launch of History in the Making, a, a book of three political essays written by Mr. Surin Khirwadkar. My name is Gauri and I am very happy to welcome you to this special occasion. Apart from Mr. Surin Khirwadkar, we have three more members over here whom I will introduce in the due course. You know, we all live in very turbulent times. All you have to do is switch on the TV and see any news channel to know what the world is going through. And you know, as political leaders across the world and geopolitical experts convene to make sense of the new world order, it is important that we take a step back and look at the world from a civilizational perspective. Now, that is where this book, History in the Making, comes in. Mr. Suren Khirwadkar has been a seasoned corporate leader and he has travelled across the world in many, many countries and seen them firsthand. In this book, he writes about what he has seen in these countries, his keen observations, the, uh, his take on their language, their culture, their ethos, their history and what they are as a people and what they contribute to the world. I will not take more time. In fact, I would like to go back to Mr. Khirwadkar and have him explain in his own words what history in the making is all about. Mr. Khirwadkar, thank you so much for joining us over here. So, let's begin this chat. I'm, I'm very curious to know what made you write this book and how did you go about it? Thank you very much, Gauri. You know, I've been a student of political science and I have studied in Holkar College in Doha and uh, in Northwestern University, Chicago. And in my studies of political science, I realized that you can't understand political science or politics unless you understand history. But the whole problem is that history is such a dull and boring subject. You know, whereas political science is something that is happening you know, around you and you inevitably become a part of it. As far as history is concerned, it concerns the dead people and unfortunately it is also written by people who are likely to become history very soon. <laughs> and the other image of history that we all have is that of, you know, musty library halls and dusty books and most history books are written in a time that we all have forgot. Now at the same time, as many uh, philosophers have said, that if you don't know your history, then you will be forced, you will be compelled to relive it. George Santayana said it, uh, Edmund Burke said it, and it is, it is true in a, in a very, uh, very philosophical sense. So I said that, how can I make history interesting for the people? How can I make history uh, contemporaneous? And then I was struck by this aphorism which is attributed to the husband of Catherine Graham the founder of the Washington Post, mm -hmm. who said that journalism is the first draft of history. Absolutely. And because, you know, journalism talks about what is happening, which is about events that are likely to become history. Mm -hmm. So I said that if, if journalism is the first draft, of history, how can I try and improve upon that draft so that history then becomes current affairs as happened when the period was not current. Absolutely. Now, the other interesting thing is this, that whereas human beings have inhabited the planet Earth for two million years. The recorded history is for just about 5,000 years. And if you look upon the great civilizations who have really made, you know, man what he is or woman what she is, 
we have to look back on the uh, Mesopotamian civilization or the Indus Valley civilization and many other civilizations that came much, much later than that. So what I have tried to do in this book, and I have to thank Xi Jinping for this, because if the COVID had not happened, and if the normal life were carrying on, I would possibly be seen on the golf course <laughs> or uh, having a drink or two with my friends, either at my home or in their places, uh, or going to uh, music festivals like Sabai Gandharva, or uh, you know, taking care of the art gallery that I once owned in Pune. So what happened was that the Center for uh, Advanced Strategic Studies in Pune University, mm -hmm. they asked me if I would write uh, an essay for their magazine, mm -hmm. quarterly magazine. And that's when I wrote the first essay, Les Miserables, The Decline and Fall of America. Because having studied in America and having visited America at least 20, 25 times in different parts of the country, I have still got some very good friends. And the thing that I share with them is a sense of loss. You know, America at one time was an aspirational country yeah. for many people in the world. The American fact, dream. Absolutely. In fact, I remember the famous words of uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who once said that most Indians that I have met, they would like to be born Americans in the next <laughs> incarnation. Because that was the country that we all wanted our country to be. Economically prosperous, politically inclusive, mm -hmm. and very kind, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, society, mm -hmm. which would make sure that nobody was left behind. And what we see now, especially in the last five, ten years, is an America that has betrayed its promise. And that's when, you know, I, uh, I, I looked upon the books that I had studied and I thought of Tocqueville, uh, the French uh, political uh, philosopher uh, who wrote uh, uh, a most wonderful book on his travels to America. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I felt, I had a flash of uh, epiphany, mm -hmm. whereby it seemed to me that the Les Miserables, the, the miserable people of Victor Hugo's novel, uh, they seem to have got reincarnated as the supporters of Trump, the Trumpists. Mm -hmm. And then one thing led to another. And, you know, because I'm, uh, I'm uh, extremely uh, uh, respectful of what the, what the Jews have accomplished. You know, when you look at the fact that they are a very small country, and they are a very small nation of mm. you know, just about 10 million people. Mm. And what they have accomplished in any form of uh, study or any science, any field of science, or, you know, it's absolutely incredible the number of Nobel laureates that they have produced. It is. And at the same time, you know, uh, there is no uh, 
uh, people other than the Jews who had suffered for so long in history for almost 2000 years and they have been discriminated by practically most of the religions although although uh, you know Judaism is a religion of the book the other two books i the christianity and uh, uh, islam they have had very uh, inimical kind of relationship mm -hmm. uh, in fact i i remember i have i have quoted that particular historian american historian who said that if these external factors had not reduced the population mm -hmm. the jews today would have been close to 200 million people than what 8 or 10 million people that they are today right. so what i have tried to see is you know their struggle mm -hmm. to have a safe and peaceful homeland mm -hmm. uh, you know one of the things that struck me when i was doing the research was that most homes most jewish homes they leave one part of their house unfinished and that is because they hope that one day they are going to go to the promised land jerusalem mm -hmm. and then we come to afghanistan you know what is happening in afghanistan is so so hard rending that you know you just can't you know understand how people can be so cruel to one another you know afghanistan is a poor country but it's a rich past mm. it's been called graveyard of the empires and so on but more than the empires it's been the graveyard of the afghan people you know for the last 2000 years you know marauders have come your armies of chinggis khan and timurlen and alexander the great and uh, and the and the british and the russians and their uh, you know the the big uh, imperialistic game the game of the shadows that they used to uh, indulge in i remember once a taliban commander told the uh, nato uh, general mm -hmm. i think rick hillie netherlands i think he was the general of that country they said that you may have the watches but we have the time and that's what we have seen now they all have come and they all have gone the russians have gone the british have gone winston churchill as a young uh, uh, army uh, young uh, recruit uh, who used to send dispatches from the afghan uh, war zones to the british newspapers in london all have disappeared all have gone and what is left are the are the hungry people uh, you know the the women who can't go to schools colleges they can't pursue any profession they need a guardian to even leave the home mm. the children who currently more than half of them are malnourished they don't have money to buy food and we are going to have a catastrophe of incredible proportions and the whole world is just watching so i mean when i read this all i said that i have to make this thing contemporary i have to make this thing readable i don't want to just write a book and then it goes into university uh, shelves i want people to you know read the book buy the book share the book give it to other people not because i would make money out of it in fact i am not going to make money out of it this is not a money making venture 
this is to bring history to life and to tell people that you have to know what is happening in the world. Thank you, Mr. Khirwadkar. It was very insightful. And some of the points which I, uh, I really, they struck me were that you are looking at this from a truly civilizational perspective. When you said how great civilizations shape us as individuals, I can't help but think that, you know, uh, your travels must have contributed a lot to how you look at all these places and even other places where you have been to. And uh, could you please tell us a bit more about how traveling and how living in these countries and meeting those people firsthand has uh, affected or impacted the way you think and observe and write about them? I am very glad you asked that question because uh, uh, first of all I have always enjoyed traveling and uh, the fact that I was working for great multinationals uh, like uh, Unilever, like Colgate Palmolive, like Nabisco, like Citibank, they gave me uh, you know, great opportunities to visit these places. In fact, I remember there used to be a slogan of the US Navy, a recruiting slogan. They used to say, join the Navy and see the world. <laughs> and uh, when I joined the uh, 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 City Bank, I said that, you know, I didn't have to join Navy, but I'm seeing the whole world now. <laughs> Wonderful. You know, I, my first, uh, you know, posting was in Iran. Mm -hmm. And I lived in Tehran. And uh, I went there when Shah of Iran was still on the throne, mm -hmm. and uh, you know Tehran was uh, was as good, if not better, than the glittering cities of London and Paris and New York and Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really love loved Iranian people. You know, I have not seen a more beautiful people, men, women, children, even old people. So. So, uh, so elegant, so well-dressed, so conscious. In fact, I still remember that you know, the shampoo market mm -hmm. in Iran mm -hmm. was much bigger than the toothpaste market. <laughs> okay. you know, because people, they simply uh, you know, uh, t used to take uh, men or women, they used to take great care of themselves. And they were, they really opened their hearts to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, even when things were bad, after the arrival of Ayatollah Khomeini, mm -hmm. my uh, colleagues who were all Iranian, mm -hmm. bar none, they all said that Mr. Surain, because they could never pronounce my last <laughs> name, <laughs> Mr. Surain, you are part of us, you live here, if American companies go back, doesn't matter, we will help you, we will work for you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, politics being what it is, mm -hmm. it uh, ruled our lives, it ruined our lives. And then I moved, uh, my, my company, Colgate Pamali, they moved me first to London, then I was in uh, New York for a while, and then they posted me in French West Africa, Ivory Coast, uh, mm -hmm. where I had the opportunity to learn French language. And uh, then, uh, of course, I visited Paris uh, many times, uh, once a quarter, because that's where the, uh, the, the operational headquarters used to be. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently, I have lived in uh, Saudi Arabia, I have lived in Bahrain, I have lived in the UAE and as I said I have visited many many uh, cities uh, because of my professional and other interests. I must have been to uh, England at least 30-40 times. I have travelled in most countries of Europe. I uh, have not travelled South America uh, and I really can't explain that. But all these travels, you know, uh, uh, we used to say uh, when I was studying in uh, Indore that Kelane uh, Deshatana Pandita Maitri Saveta Sanchar, which means you get to know uh, wise people, you get to participate in uh, debates and discussions and so on, and it really broadens your mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you can't really, you know, write history. 
you know, sitting in your room or yes, sitting in the libraries. Even yes. Admiral Toynbee, you know, when he traveled through Afghanistan and, uh, you know, he wrote uh, about uh, Afghanistan. I mean, it's a very fascinating, you know, observation that he has made. So, all these travels, mm -hmm. they have made me what I am. A very quick question, Mr. Kriwatsar. <coughs> How long did it take you to write this book? <laughs> You know, as I said, I have to thank uh, Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the COVID uh, started two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I, you know, started to do some research, first on America and then on other, mm -hmm. other subjects. And then suddenly it struck me that maybe, you know, I have stumbled upon, as an archaeologist, on a new genre mm -hmm. of writing. So that I am looking at uh, history from the point of view of people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, uh, civilization and, uh, you know, the, the important people, the, the small people, those who have contributed to that civilization. And let's be very clear about it. It's not only Alexander the Great or Herodotus or Plato and Aristotle who contribute to the civilization. You know, it's the person who discovered the blow, the person who discovered the wheel. You know, all these people have contributed to what we are today. Mm -hmm. We look at the pyramid and then we say that, my goodness, how did they carry, you know, these uh, blocks of stone, you know, weighing, uh, you know, 50, 75, 150 tons, you know, all the way up. And when you see the contribution of the hundreds of thousands of, you know, slaves or the, uh, the, the workers, then you realize that those people have contributed as much to the uh, history and civilization mm. as some of the names that I have taken before. Mr. Kirwarkar, this might be a COVID project, but uh, <laughs> given your travels and the richness of your experience, this book has been in the making for decades. <laughs> That's what I would say. Thank you. I have one last question for you before I move on to the others. I happened to see a picture of uh, Shivaji Maharaj in the book, and today is Shiv Jayanti. So, uh, could you tell me about what, what made you think of launching this book today on this occasion? You know, I think uh, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, and I'll get very emotional when I speak about him. He is a, one of the greatest heroes, you know, of mankind. And he has not received the kind of respect and the kind of recognition that he deserves. I can understand the Western uh, historians not giving importance to uh, Shivaji Maharaj. I can also understand the Indian historians who have, uh, as Macaulay's children, have been more influenced by what the prejudiced historians wrote. And they had no time for uh, historians like Jadunath Sarkar or uh, Riyasitkar Sardesai or many others and what really uh, I personally feel that there is only one warrior king to whom perhaps Shivaji can be compared and that's Alexander the Great and even he because he was he inherited an empire from his father and because the uh, his focus was more on expanding uh, his empire. He cannot be fully compared with Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. Shivaji Maharaj lived in a very difficult uh, environment where even his father did not support him as much as any warrior king's father should have or would have or could have supported. 
सो छत्रपति शिवाजी महाराज इज अ सेल्फ मेड किंग एंड वॉट ही अकॉम्प्लिश इन फिफ्टी ईयर्स एंड इफ यू सी द एक्सपांस ऑफ द मराठा एम्पायर यू नो वेन ही पास्ट अवे अनफॉर्चुनेटली एट द एज ऑफ फिफ्टी बट हिज ग्रेट मिशन वॉज कैरीड ऑन बाय हिज सक्सेसर्स एंड बाय द पेशवास एंड द फैक्ट दैट you know the peshwas went all the way up to afghanistan and if you know madhav rao you know had not um, succumbed uh, at the age of 25 if i remember right who knows maybe the entire india would have been maratha empire so uh, i i feel that uh, you know the people who like to take his name to get votes they would do something uh, you know for uh, shivaji maharaj you know there are some 6 and a half 7000 forts in the world yes and of these about 1000 forts are in india and i think about 300 forts of those are in maharashtra but what is the condition of these forts you know we are keen on spending money on hundreds of various projects some of which are very worthy they should be you know espoused but why can't we you know do something for the forts that shivaji built and some of those forts are absolutely extraordinary in architect architectural design and so on and when i go to say rajasthan for example i i see how beautifully they have maintained their forts you know it seems to me that we really are uh, uh, the there only one marathi good word that i can think of currente <laughs> we do not realize what great history we have and we are very happy fighting for minor things here and there so that's my great regret and i feel that this is one small very very small insignificant way in which i am i am giving my tribute to shivaji maharaj honestly i am at a loss for words <laughs> because having been born and brought up in maharashtra i uh, it strikes a chord inside me when you speak about how we need to value our history and how we need to value the heroes this land has produced um i would like to move on to uh, miss anga uh, uh miss anga your publishing house apk publishers has published more than 150 books in the last 10 to 12 years what was your experience in publishing this book and how, how did you uh, what did you think of it like when you first came across it when you came across the idea then when you came across the manuscript what did it mean for you and how was the experience Uh, thank you gauri i think <clears throat> this is a very valid question uh, when first mr kirwadkar called me i think it was a random call <laughs> and <clears throat> he was looking for a printer if i'm not mistaken and then i said uh, i'm not a printer uh, it's a publishing house apk publishers and i manage manage it so um, he was he was not sure whether you know how it's going to go and then he decided to meet me and the first impression was uh, Oh, he is just awesome. That is what I felt, <laughs> and I still feel the same thing. And when he he had a dummy copy, and you know, I was just browsing and looking at it, and uh, I was impressed. I was impressed with even that quality, which was mm-hmm. also very good. Mm-hmm. And then um, I kind of read the first essay in America uh, because I've been I've been I lived there for six years, so it was very close to my heart, and I could relate to some of the things that were mentioned and the downfall. and then i said okay uh, let us do it and mm-hmm. <clears throat> non fiction is not the genre which we do uh, okay. we, we have done few books but not uh, not a lot we are uh, pretty good at sh- short stories you know fictional short stories mm-hmm. so then uh, he was also very interested in doing it with us and i kind of liked it so i said let, let us let us go about it we started reading and then i said we need to apply for copyright we started working and uh, we enjoyed mm-hmm. it i think since up to november so it's been like 3 months of joyful ride yes. with history in the making yeah. wonderful wonderful <laughs> very fascinating to hear that uh, tasneem i would like to come to you now 
Okay. You are the co-founder of uh, Finesse Editing Agency and you have edited more than 500 books so far. Okay. So and as the editor, you are the closest to this book. I mean, after Mr. Khirwadkar, you know it the best. What has your experience been like, you know, reading all these topics, uh, learning about them, going through it all and editing it, how has it been for you? Okay, thank you, Gauri. And uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Sarain Sir, Anaka for giving me this wonderful opportunity because I gleaned a lot of knowledge while uh, going through this book and it was all new to me because I am not much of a political buff okay. and uh, I don't really understand politics much. So, and this was a non-fiction book, so I was not much, you know, relatable to it and all. But after going through it and all, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I actually went to Google and I googled a lot of, uh, you know, terms and all because I wanted to know more about uh, the background and all. So, mm -hmm. thank you, sir, for actually enhancing my knowledge. And um, uh, this was, um, it's a very interesting way of uh, putting across history and politics. Uh, two subjects which can become very monotonous yes. in reading especially. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's made it so engaging and you can identify with uh, all the facts and all that. Okay, yeah, I had heard about this. Okay, right. so this is what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see the plus point of this book is that uh, Surin sir doesn't take any sides. Okay. So, because mm -hmm. I have edited a lot of political books, a lot of historical books, but the author is always prejudiced or biased towards one side, his opinion, his or her opinion. Mm -hmm. So, but this book gives the facts as is it. Mm -hmm. And you, it is left upon the reader to make the decision if you want to, mm -hmm. that you know, okay, which side should I take? But uh, sir has just put it across, okay, this is what happened and this is what is happening and as a consequence, this is what might happen. So we need to, you know, uh, be aware of that. So you are entitled to your own opinion. So which I feel is a very good thing because in politics, everybody ends up taking sides. Of course. Of but course. Uh, sir has kept it, kept a very neutral stand. So hats off to him for that. And uh, it was a joy, a very, a very precious opportunity. So thank you very much. Quick question. Did you end up make, building your opinions? Not really, because as I said, I'm, a poli I'm not a very politic person and all, but uh, it was a good, I came to know a lot of new things, uh, like, you know, I mean, about Israel and Palestine, I did not exactly know what was it, I knew there were conflicts and all, right. but I couldn't understand why are they conflicting, I mean, okay, give the Jews the, their land, I mean, what is your problem, you know, <laughs> kind of a layman uh, opinion or something like that, right. but this is what I came to know, actually, what is the problem and how some people actually you know either two or four so uh, yeah it was it really enhanced my knowledge but uh, no I didn't really form any opinions because I mean who was going to ask for my opinions so I was just happy getting to know so you know in the future I can converse intelligibly so thank you sir again for that well you've certainly contributed in helping people build informed opinions of their own so thanks a lot thank you uh, we'll now move to Amog um, Amog is the co-founder of Clueless Long Technologies it is a boutique agency which uh, helps knowledge creating organizations and knowledge creating individuals like Mr. Khirwadkar uh, to uh, promote their uh, work and uh, increase their outreach. So Amog, uh, do you think there is one certain right way of promoting such a unique book like History in the Making? And um, is there, uh, I mean, does it have to be conventional? Does it have to be inconventional? What's your outlook towards this? Right, so I'll first uh, quickly tell you about how I got introduced to the book. Uh, so uh, I got introduced to Mr. Kirwadkar through uh, my mentor Mr. Anil Kulkarni and uh, I remember meeting uh, Mr. Kirwadkar in Vaishali and he gave me the draft of the book and I took the draft. It was in the middle of the day, I was in between things. I went home, I read it and I remember thinking that there's no way we are not promoting this. <laughs> because at the end of the day, um, there is a very famous Hindi movie dialogue ki, uh, So mm. it is essentially a story and uh, after reading the book you realize that uh, above all the roles that he has played, the role of a traveller, the role of, a, of a, um, a historian, the primary role he plays in, in, in writing this book is that of a storyteller and uh, mm. that's the role I personally, as somebody who comes from a science background, who has no background in history, after I mean, after my school days, I've never uh, picked up a history book. Uh, someone like that, uh, 
for, for someone like me and there are countless people like me out there for them it's the storyteller which sort of communicates with us because if you think of history books then you think of the, like like uh, kirwadkar uh, mr kirwadkar said you think of um, theorists you think of people who give you dates you think mm. of people who tell you what happened when and then this book is a story where they tell you the story of of its people so yes there will be a traditional approach towards marketing of course will be there on all social media handles will be there on youtube and will be talking to people uh, will be making sure that more and more uh, enthusiasts more and more groups come in contact with mr kirwadkar and they uh, they are able to hear him first hand uh, will be also uh, shooting a small uh, sort of a docu series where he talks about each of the chapters so all that traditional approach the digital approach is there but uh, what i would also like to tell is uh, the kind of audience that we are targeting here uh, we are not just going to go after people who like history or we are not just going to go after the obvious ones are those obviously and then there are people who are um, uh, aspirants for government exams aspirants for defense exams who have or at least need this kind of background so they are obviously going to be there but beyond that we are also going to sort of convert people here people who have once had fascination of history who had once always all of us had had fascination of stories and now this is something uh, uh, that they would learn new like he said he stumbled upon the genre and we want more and more people to get exposed to this genre and while doing that that is why we we also going to try uh, several different things several unique things uh like shooting the docu series where where you get the author's perspective on each of the stories that he's trying to tell on each of the chapter on each of the countries so these are some different and uh, to the audience what i would like to tell them is basically this is not just a book that you take read and keep it this is a book that you distribute this is a book that you gift uh if you know an uh, if you know a student who is aspiring for a government exam or if you know your Uh, somebody uh, in your house who is uh, who is a retired pro- uh, professional this book is basically for all of them so this book is more about uh, you know sharing the story uh, rather than just buying the book and keeping it to yourself and uh, being informed yourself so that's the approach uh, clueless monk technologies is going to take and like you had mentioned in your introduction we do work with uh, knowledge creating organizations and individuals specifically from that point of view in mind so yeah that's that's my take Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I would just like to add to that when we you were speaking about the kind of audience we have for the book. There's one more category I would like to add here is this new um, section of Indians who are very comfortable in their own skin, yeah. but who want to know about the world, yeah. who want to go out and who want to see the world from an unfiltered lens, from a non-academic lens, from a very original and authentic lens of people they can relate to. And I think that is where the book is. the book is in a very sweet spot over there and i think those people would definitely take this book and read it distribute it uh, go back to it again and again because these are stories which are not just a point in history but they speak of a whole civilization so uh, with that i would like to come to you mr kirwadkar uh, is this like a one book thing is it a stand alone book or can we expect more from you <clears throat> excellent question actually uh, you know as i said thanks to hujin ping and i keep on thinking his name <laughs> i hope you don't mind <laughs> the fact of the matter is that uh, you know i've been uh, working on uh, various you know countries uh, civilizational history uh, for the last two years uh, in fact my second volume is uh, also ready in fact mm-hmm. i have sent it for copyright and uh, Uh, that uh, talks about four countries uh it talks about uh, uh, armenia uh it talks about uh, egypt mm-hmm. it talks about lebanon and it talks about turkey because all these four countries they have got a sort of space in my mind uh, armenia because uh, you know till a few years ago you know nobody very few people know that armenia uh has the oldest church mm-hmm. oldest church in christianity okay and uh, the armenians despite the onslaught uh from the caliphate they kept on holding on to their religion 
making political friends in Russia especially and they held on to their faith which is a great thing and when I read uh, excerpts of the book of uh, Ambassador Morgenthau mm -hmm. to uh, Turkey in 1918, 1920 and when, uh, when I read about the, uh, the genocide mm -hmm. you know it's a word that uh, as Elif Shafak, the Turkish female writer, mm -hmm. has said, you know, this word does not exist in Turkish language. And they, even now, they refuse to believe that there was a huge genocide in which millions of Armenians and Greeks um, were wiped out. And I therefore felt that a, a, a people who were abandoned mm. by even the people of their own faith, uh, you know, I mean, for example, the UK, uh, uh, and there are many countries in the world who still do not re recognize uh, that it was a genocide. Mm. So I, I really felt that their story needed to be told. Mm. And then Egypt again because it's one of the greatest uh, ancient civilizations and you can't understand the world you know if you don't understand uh, Egyptian civilization and what they have contributed you know to the uh, to the human uh, civilization is uh, really uh, unparalleled and then uh, when I talk about Lebanon in my essay, you know, I am, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, once again uh, heartbroken because it's another poignant tale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, such a wonderful country, mm -hmm. and when you see what uh, has happened to it because of a very weird formula of uh, ruling mm -hmm. that they have got in place and I talk about more about it by essay mm -hmm. you know and above all the extraordinary corruption I mean I know I have been uh, I worked in Citibank although I'm not a banker I worked in Citibank for 14 years I don't know of any country where the the country, uh, country's finance ministry accepts and the World Bank and the IMF, they all say that the balance sheet of the central bank equivalent to the Reserve Bank in Lebanon is all wrong, is all full of mistakes. I mean, the, the governor of the Reserve Bank uh, Salami and and uh, the uh, the young beautiful executive assistant that he picked up from nowhere without even an MBA degree and made her the second most powerful person in the Central Bank of Lebanon and together they built Lebanon country of close to hundred billion dollars. I mean. How can this sort of thing happen unless the, 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 the key people in the government over 15-20 years were part of it? Yeah. So that, I thought that story needed to be told. And then finally Turkey. Hmm. You know, Turkey is a very, uh, is, a, is a most amazing uh, you know, history hmm. uh, to, to read, to watch, to see. You know, you uh, at one time the Turkish Empire went all the way up to Russia, yeah. and uh, uh, you know because they got uh, pushed back uh, either you know during the Crusades or subsequently by the uh, by the forces of the uh, European allies, uh, Christian countries. Uh, you know, today now Turkey is of course a, a poor shadow of itself. 
And what is happening in Turkey now is, is, is a, uh, you know, Turkey is a split personality. And you have the, on the one hand, you have the, uh, the military which still, and, and a lot of secular uh, forces that follow the philosophy of Kemal Ataturk, mm -hmm. the father of modern Turkey. And then on the other hand, you have, uh, you have the present uh, uh, President Erdogan who has concentrated power within himself and who wants to take Turkey on the path of fundamentalism mm. and he is uh, not looking at the common man, the people. You know, Turkey is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a great uh, case study mm. of what happens when people who don't understand economics, they become heads of state. Mm. And that's why you have a situation where their currency lira, Lebanese pound, uh, the currency has lost 50% of its value. Now you can imagine what it does to the poor people, what, what it does to the people who have retired. You know, suddenly you find that your savings, half the savings have disappeared. Mm -hmm. And when you think of Turkey, you think of not only the Caliphate, but you also think of Rumi. You also think of uh, you know, you know his poetry, his uh, his broad vision, uh, whereby he he had no problems with people. You know, understanding, learning from other people, from other religions, and the one of the finest, one of the greatest poets in any language. And today, you know, Rumi's. Turkey has disappeared and what you see is you know Erdogan's Turkey which is uh, not at all uh, in the interest of the poor Turkish people. That is indeed a very fascinating peek into <coughs> what we can expect next. Uh, but I want to say one more thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it applies to both my first volume and the second volume. Mm -hmm. I owe an immense <coughs> amount of gratitude to Google and Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I like to refer to them as the two of the greatest universities in the world who are giving knowledge free to anyone who is interested in seeking knowledge mm. and this book would not have been possible or the volume 2 that I'm talking about that mm. would not have been possible without Google and Wikipedia. That's, that's wonderful sir and um, this is definitely a very fascinating peek into the next volume what we can expect to read in it what we can expect to learn in it. Mm. Uh, for now uh, you can uh, avail the history in the making I think both paperback and hardcover edition on Amazon and also the website of APK Publishers. We'll be sharing all these links across social media, namely on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn. And uh, we will also uh, so, uh, we will also share other details of the book including the docu-series which Amok spoke about. So please do make sure that you follow us on all these handles, that you check out the link of the book on uh, Amazon and APK Publishers and of course Please buy the book, read it, send us your thoughts and feedback, uh, distribute it, gift it, gift it. Uh, lend it, share it, everything that's possible. So uh, with this, I would like to conclude this wonderful session where we all got to meet each other and exchange such amazing thoughts and views. There's, there's a, there are stories in the book, but there's a huge story behind the book as well. And I'm glad we could bring it out today. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.